Welcome to the Marshall Pro Podcast, brought to you by Cooper Tires and the Justice Brothers in this week's episode of Inside the Sports Car Paddock. As usual, we lead off with the supremely awesome race engineer, old friend of almost 30 years, Jeff Brown of the Core Auto Sport IMSA Nissan Onroke DPI effort. And we are talking about shaker rigs, four post, seven post, didn't get into all the different kinds of suspension, checking, tuning type of platforms, but did center mostly on four post, a little bit about seven post, knowing that we're not trying to explain everything all at once in one single episode, definitely leaving us lots more to discuss in a part two, who knows, maybe a part three. So if you've heard about shaker rigs, wondered what they are or how they serve value, why race engineers like Jeff absolutely love finding time on them to make the race cars go faster, you will certainly enjoy the opening discussion with Jeff as he makes us smarter on a weekly basis. We then move into a series of interviews captured by my friend Stephen Kilby from DailySportsCar.com, this all coming from this week's prologue. Opening up of the WEC's almost about ready to go 2019-2020 season. Also some ELMS action that he's been in and around. So we start off with his interview with FIA, WEC, and ELMS CEO Gerard Nouveau talking about the Lige European Series launch, ELMS at Barcelona, and what to expect from the WEC this year, including this final confirmation that they're switching away from the unsuccessful EOT equivalents of technology practice in LMP1. They will indeed be shifting to balance of performance there. Next, we move to good old Harry Tignall, our friend, he of LMP2, LMP this, LMP that, GT Racing, DPI. This conversation with Harry is about his Carlin LMP2 drive and also the end of the Ford GT program, unfortunately, in the WEC, in Mazda's turn towards winning with the last two DPI victories going to the Japanese brand he happens to represent. After Harry, we move back to another French accent, our friend Nicolas Lapierre, with the new cool racing team. Young Mr. Lapierre talks about winning Le Mans for the fourth time in LMP2, leaving the Alpine program, and what to expect from Cool Racing in the WEC. Then we close this episode with Ben Crawley, the director of Goodyear Racing Europe, on Goodyear's move into the WEC. So we've got our man, Mr. Jeff Brown, making us smart in the beginning, talking about shaking and shaker rigs, then a series of great interviews from young Stephen Kilby. Then you'll hear some music fade in towards the end of the interview with Ben Crawley, and we will be done for this episode and following right behind it is a special prologue episode captured by Stephen and Graham Goodwin. Going to double up on Inside the Sports Car Paddock this week. And off we go, brought to you by Cooper Tires and the Justice Brothers with our man Jeff Brown. It's our weekly Get Smarter with Jeff Brown segment. We are going to be talking about manufacturing miniature earthquakes. Is that is that is that what happens, Jeff, or, or what is it we're going to talk about today? Yeah, no, that's actually it. And and scaring anybody who ever designed, worked on, mechanic, or is in charge of reliability of race cars, um, earthquakes and and scaring those people are what we're going to talk about today. We have shaker rigs, a multi-post device which holds a vehicle, simulates a lap and allows engineers like yourself to try different settings. We're talking suspension settings here to see if and how the car responds the way that you would want it to. But we should probably start off with Jeff before going into the hardcore aspects of shaker rig testing. What is it in its basic form in terms of the the mechanical and hydraulic and electric systems? What is it? And why did folks come up with, let's say, the very first one, which has sprouted and become an industry standard? Yeah, it's um, it, it kind of went along with testing um, 
when people started doing wind tunnel testing and all of that, it's, you know, we went to the racetracks and we said, okay, we understand how this is working. We have sensors on the car and everything. We understand how this is working, but we need to know more about certain aspects of it. With the aerodynamics, it was downforce and drag. And they said, well, what the wind changes and things, we need to measure it more accurately. So we came up with wind tunnels and we could measure it very accurately and make a lot of changes in a short period of time in a controlled environment. Suspension kind of came the same way and and more what really probably led it in racing more than anything else was the development of shock absorbers of the modern racing damper or shock absorber and how that became a very powerful tuning tool to make the cars make more grip and then engineers wanted to know more about them and we had shock dynos which we've talked about in past episodes and then the next step was, well, yeah, that shows me how the shock works, but how does it all integrate on the car, the whole car? So obviously when a race car goes around a racetrack, the tires move up and down, the chassis moves up and down, it rolls, it pitches, it jumps up and down on bumps. And so somebody said, well, maybe we could simulate that in a controlled environment. And they came up with the first rig and it was a four post rig. So if you picture the post being a hydraulic, very sophisticated, but we'll just think of it as a hydraulic actuator, like an hydraulic ram that can move in and out. Those, there's one of those rams and they're in a, in an actual shaker rig, they're anywhere from four feet to six feet long and they're sunk in the ground usually. And On top of that ram is a plate, about maybe two feet by two foot plate, and you set the race car on those four plates. A lot of fans may have seen um, race cars on the setup plate in under the tent at racetracks where we're weighing the car. Well, it looks very similar, but below that plate is a hydraulic ram. Then what you do is those rams are connected by fast actuating servos and hydraulic systems and electronic control systems to a computer in a in a control room and we can program those rams to move in any way we want so what happens is when you move them up and down it moves the tires up and down and the chassis moves up and down in response to it just like the car would as it rolls over the racetrack, over a bump or over a dip or around a corner. And so you then have a bunch of sensors on the car that measure the reaction to the input because you know the input to the ram, exactly how you're exciting the car or moving the car. And then you can measure the shock displacement, the velocity, the acceleration, the frequency of the chassis response to all of that and get an output. And if you know the input to the vehicle and an output of the vehicle, you can tell what happened in between and where the energy went and all of that. And so that's a four post rig because it has four posts under the tires. The question is, well, how does that make you go faster? It's cool that you know that, but how does it make you go faster? And I'll, I'll just and insert here quickly, Jeff. Some of you might mm-hmm. have seen a fairly famous image photograph from the 1960s, and I believe it was my hero Dan Gurney effectively sitting on the back of an open-wheel race car, <laughs> you know, strapped up, kind of holding on for dear life above the engine, but uh, just – his big frame perched over the back, riding around. I don't remember who was driving the car, but he was there because in the absence of, say, GoPros, uh, decades before shaker rigs and computer simulation, being the big eagle, being the technical mind, the, the designer and whatnot, he wanted to see what the chassis was doing, what the suspension was doing primarily, what movement was taking place between compression of the damper interaction with the anti-roll bar he was trying to (laughs) simulate what we do now right on a multi-post shaker rig in the only way that he could at the time 
which is to sit on the back of the dang car while it's going around the track. So just, again, imagine the quest for knowledge. Hey, we just put on a spring that's 100 pounds stiffer. How is that going to alter how much the damper compresses and it interacts with this chassis yeah. roll and squat and dive and all these things wanting to quantify the only way he could at that time with his eyes. Well, this is effectively the remedy. Now, granted, throw now maybe that's what we need to do as well. If <laughs> series allow the use of multi-post uh, shaker rigs, maybe drivers also have to uh, do at least a few laps strapped to the car trying to look and see themselves and give back detailed reports. <laughs> maybe, yeah, that might uh, make them actually take it a little bit easier when they just fling it off a curb and land all, all four wheels off the ground and land and the thing starts bucking around. Um, drivers might get an appreciation for what that really looks like if they sat in the control room and watched the watch the car. It's it's it can be pretty scary. It that it moves around a lot and always surprises even engineers who see the data with the shot placements and are like, really? It's it can't look like that. Well, it it, it does. It can move pretty violently and and that's the cool thing about the shaker rig because what Dan Gurney was looking at, he got as it turns out now, 2% of the information. What we can get is the actual loads that are being transmitted from the tire to those plates. And obviously what you want to go around a corner as fast as possible is you want the most load on downward load on your tire as possible because that pushes the rubber into the into the aggregate of the asphalt and allows you to go around faster and make more grip. So we're looking, it's a grip measuring machine. And as to take it one step further, what's really important, more important than the actual force on the tire is what all the shaker rig guys call contact patch load variation. So it's the load on the tire is important, but how it varies, you want it to vary as little as possible. So in other words, when it hits a bump, you don't want it to go from 500 pounds to 100 pounds and then back to 700 pounds and then back to 200 pounds all in the space of one car length of movement because drivers have a hard time adjusting to that change in grip level. So what we're looking for is minimum contact patch load variation. And that's exactly what a shaker rig measures is how that varies. So we'll do a run and we start out with just like a sine wave, for instance, where the tires push, the actuator pushes the tire up and down and up and down in kind of a slow um, motion kind of motion and then you'll increase that a little faster and faster and faster and faster and the car starts to vibrate the actual chassis will actually start to vibrate and you'll see like a natural resonance where the chassis may be moving 180 degrees out of phase and then as you increase the speed of the tire movement from the actuator it'll get in phase where they're moving actually together and then they can actually go out of phase where the chassis starts moving faster and with more amplitude than the tire. Now, that's really bad. And so then we can make shock adjustments from the internals of our shock absorbers, spring adjustments, tire pressure adjustments, uh, weight distribution adjustments, and check it again and see how that resonance is and where it is and what the contact patch load variation was. Always looking for the least contact patch load variation. and then you can go to the racetrack with all the settings that are best for that and go try them on the actual racetrack. So if we're looking at, say, the next round that you'll be headed to with your Nissan on Roke DPI, going to a big and fast track like Road America, Mm -hmm. And you say have booked some time on the good old seven post shaker rig. I know we've spoken about the four post shaker rig right now, but seven post, and we will do a light introduction as to what a seven versus a four happens to be probably end up doing a future second edition with some of the deeper arts of uh, shaker rigification. But 
as you're getting ready to go to the next round here to compete and say you had some time on a seven post, what would you be looking to do and thinking about Elkhart Lake and mm-hmm. also knowing that the vehicle that you have to use is indeed a downforce car, why might you choose to go to a seven post maybe compared to some who only have a four post rig to offer for rent? Yeah, that's a great question. It's, it's as cars started making more and more downforce, it, it becomes a very big component of the grip of the car. And so a four post rig has its four actuators under one underneath each tire. But in reality, what's happening is, you know, you're, we're trying to simulate what really happens on the racetrack. Well, the, the chassis just doesn't sit there on those four posts, the actual, um, and on the race track, it doesn't just sit on the four tires. You have the wings, the underbody, the tunnels, the splitter, everything making downforce pulling or actually pushing the car chassis down. So in a shaker rig, we had to try to simulate that because it has a big influence on the natural frequency. You can picture, I was just talking about the car vibrating up and down when the tires are moved up and down on a four post rig. Well, if you were to put 3000 pounds of downforce on the chassis during that, that vibration would change considerably. And the point when it started resonating would change com- completely. So to simulate it more accurately, we added three more actuators and normally there's one more actuator under the nose of the car and it's tied to the actual chassis to the nose of the chassis and it can pull down on the chassis with whatever simulated downforce level the front of your car makes so if you have been to the wind tunnel and you know that it makes uh, 1500 pounds of front downforce you then program the front actuator, the fifth actuator of our seven post rig to pull down with the same force that the aerodynamics produce. And then that actuator is fast enough acting to pull down, but always keep that 1500 pounds because obviously the chassis is moving up and down with the wheels are moving up and down. And you can't just pull straight down with 1,500 pounds. It has to be an additional 1,500 pounds. So there's some very sophisticated, fast-acting valves that measure that force and just always add 1,500 pounds to the front of the car. At the rear, it's the same way. But because the car rolls, we use two points, one on either side of the rear of the car, and we pull down We split the rear downforce with those two actuators, but we can actually pull harder on the left or harder on the right, depending on what we're trying to simulate. If we're just going down a straightaway, we pull down equally, but if we're going around a corner, we can pull down and actually put a roll component in the car while we're moving the the four wheel actuators. And that brings me to another thing. We talked about a sine wave that measures it. So we're going to road America. Road America's bumps, no tracks bumps are a nice sine wave that just goes up and down, you know, in a, in a consistent way, the bumps and the movement of the car at road America are very unique to road America. It has its surface irregularities. It has its exit curves. It has its apex curves. And so what we can do with a seven post rig is actually take what's called the track drive file. And that file is derived from data recordings of our actual car. And and it almost works with any car because you're just basically using accelerometers on the wheel uprights. You drive your car around. It measures the acceleration and velocity of the wheel uprights. And it it kind of maps the track. It's kind of like a a file, a computer file, that's a picture of the bumps of the track. Well, then you can load that file into your seven post rig and actually move the wheels exactly like the track would move them. And it, it's kind of fun to watch because if you've been doing enough tracks and you're an engineer and always sits there and watches things and you look at a lot of data, 
I've had it where they can turn the shaker rig on and I can look out the window and they can turn it on and I can maybe be doing something on my computer and the car is going essentially around the racetrack because it's moving up and down and the wheels are moving up and down and, and it's going around the racetrack. And I can look up and look out at the shaker rig and not know where we are on the racetrack, but look at the shaker rig for 10 seconds and I can know what corner we're in. Because I can say, oh, there's the exit curve of turn 14. Yep, we're going up the straightaway. Mm. There's turn one. Oh, yep. Brrr. There's the right side, left side wheels on the exit curb of turn one. And, you know, you can instantly see where we are because it's moving the car exactly the way the racetrack inputs the forces into the car. And so Road America, the exit curbs are a big big problem a big issue they are very unique to that track they're part of the track you can make grip if you can use them but if your car doesn't go over the exit curbs well um, you actually lose grip because the contact patch load variation by the bumps gets set off and you get a big load variation so we'll go to road america shaker rig and we'll work on exit curbs just what can we do to reduce the contact patch load variation on the exit curves of Road America. And we'll run a lap around and we'll get our number. And then we'll try a different shock setting and we'll run a lap around and we'll get a number. Oh, better. Okay, we'll do more of that. We'll do, what about if we went softer springs and stiffer shocks? Get a number. What about stiffer springs and softer shocks? Get a number. And we're just constantly working on that. And as long as you stay within the realm of sh- of stiffness that you know you're going to have to run a lot of people go to a shaker rig and 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 shaker rigs will always show softer is better softer makes more grip but you have to still have enough platform control to control the aerodynamics to control the movement of the car and braking and acceleration and you know you can't have a super soft car and go through the kink at road america flat out the car would roll over and the driver couldn't control it and it would be impossible even though the shaker rig says it makes the most grip. Well, you, you'd actually straighten out the kink after hitting the wall. So, right, you know, you right, kind exactly. of uh, realign the corner. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So you need that platform support. So you you don't let the shaker rig guide you into areas that you just know are not realistic. But you keep it within that box. You know you're going to run. Like, here's the softest springs I would ever run at Road America for platform control. And here's kind of like the stiffest I'd ever probably really want to run. And so you work within that realm on the shaker to reduce that contact patch load variation. And then um, it, 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 and in kind of like a, a wind tunnel where you're, the holy grail is a change that makes more downforce and less drag, which probably never exists. But that's kind of what that would be like what you'd really want. In a shaker rig standpoint, what you'd like is a change that makes less contact patch load variation, so more grip, and is stiffer. So you get more platform control, and it'll feel better for the driver. Again, very rare, but you can work toward that. You might have five changes, and a couple of them stand out where they did a pretty good chunk of grip making with not having to go much softer. And so those are the ones that you then take to the racetrack, and those are at the top of your test plan, and you're going to knock through a couple of those pretty quick because the, you know, we'll say, well, the rig really liked these, and so then you try to see if it translates to the racetrack. And if your your inputs to your rig are accurate and your rig's accurate, um, oftentimes they translate pretty well, and and that's why teams go to shaker rig so much. And a lot of teams, big teams, own their own shaker rig in their shop, expensive machine. Um, you know, millions of dollars, but uh, especially NASCAR teams um, will own their own, you know, their own shaker rig in there. They have a program where they're on it all the time, just like they do with their wind tunnel program. I love it. Well, we have some other things like a K and C rig. And I mean, we've got all kinds of rigs we can discuss. (laughs) We should probably save that for a part two. Plus also any questions that might come in. For yeah. folks who have just consumed part one with our man, Mr. Jeff Brown. Jeff, thank you not only for taking time every week, but also just really 
presenting some fun conversations here for us to try and bring the technical and engineering side strategy electronics who knows we tend to wander around each week but it's often driven by the questions you send in to us so please don't hesitate to do just that curious about whatever from the technical side drop us a note on social media speaking of i've been struggling to find you on twitter lately there jeff oh yeah i kind of have to admit i might have kind of put pause on my social media stuff uh recently um trying to simplify things a little bit trying to focus on getting this nissan going faster trying to um have a little bit more time to do some some read some books and things like that Smart. so so yeah. send them my way send them yeah, my send way them. at marshall pruitt on the good old tweeters uh we also right. have our marshall what? pruitt podcast facebook page too where you can send exactly. in your questions for us and we uh we have an expanding ever expanding list of topics we'll get to them eventually but we're not in any rush so we no, want, want no, to keep doing this as long as we can Bug, bug Marshall, let him know what we want to talk about, and we'll definitely talk about it. Or come and see me at the racetrack. That's even better. I love people, fans who come up and say, hey, can you talk about this? Or can you explain that? And those are the ones that we've actually done the last two or three have been people who have just grabbed me at the racetrack and said, hey, uh, you know, love the love the podcast with Marshall. Uh, what about this? Tell me about that. So that's a cool way, too. So. Hit me up at Road America, or if anybody's at the Ferrari Challenge Race at Indianapolis next weekend, I'll be there for that, running a car. So, yeah, that's a good way to do it. Gerard Naveau, the CEO of, of the FIWC and the, and the European Le Mans Series, is with me now on, on the eve of what's going to be an incredibly action-packed selection of days we've got here at Barcelona with an into-the-night race. We've got Le Mans Cup race tomorrow here. We've got WC Prologue to look forward to. So many sports cars, so little time. Um, and because the LMS, Le Mans Cup and WC isn't enough, there's been a new championship. No, it's just um, because we need between two or three tapas and a sangria to find some ID, so that's the reason why. Yeah, so we, we're here um, just after the Ligier European Series has been launched. Mm-hmm. And I want to get your thoughts on this, uh, Gerard. We've got uh, two car series, this is, with the Ligier Jazz 2R and the Ligier Jazz before. And we were just saying, this is going to be a lot of fun. This is exactly the right word. If you have to summarize the, this new championship entering next season, it's just for fun. Just for fun. The, the, the approach is you find a, a very lowest level of GT you can find on a paddock now in sports car, and the same with the prototype. And the idea is to give an access easy for new drivers, new gentlemen drivers or new ladies driver. Never forget the ladies. And also for very young drivers who is coming out from the go-kart, for example, no money to go for single-seater, very selective, very expensive, and uh, wanted to have an approach for the sports car with the long story he can have in front of him. At the end, you can imagine the story like this. I'm a businessman, and um, I have all the successes in my life with my family, with my business, but I have only one dream or so that I never, um, that, that I never uh, achieve at this moment is to, to raise at Le Mans. Can I have the capacity to do it or not? And if you want to have that, you can test with this one first. If it's, if it's running very well, you will have a chance to jump to the Michelin Le Mans Cup in GT3 or in, Mich- or in LMP3. Then, if it's run very well, you will have a chance to jump to the ELMS in uh, GTE or in LMP3 or in LMP2. Then, later on, you have a chance to go to Le Mans. So that, that's really the, the concept. Open the door provide the f- very first stage without a mandatory real preparation before and not necessarily a huge experience of driving because this is EV easy car to drive this is really a race car and this is very safe mm, yeah and I think it's, it's only going to add to what our fantastic European Le Mans series weekends that we have not only for the people competing but for the fans as well yeah. we've already got a good support package with the LMS with the Le Mans car we see some single seaters we've got Leo's here this weekend. We've had Masters Endurance Legends. 
but this having this on the calendar as well means if you come to a European Le Mans series race you're going to get a lot of sports car racing yeah and you will enjoy the weekend if you are a new driver you will be in touch with the top team you can find in the sports car with the top organizer I mean about the official the resurrector and the staff so you will learn you will learn what is really the sports car you will you will rejoin the family and the idea also is to make sure that for all the team already involved in the in the ELMS or in the Michelin Cup, we give them, we try to provide them some opportunities to develop their own business. They can buy the car, they can organize the program that's very cheaper, a cheaper price, and they can set up something very easy with few new clients that they can keep with them to grow up after that in the paddock. So this is really the idea, and you're right, the, the ELMS is a, is a good picture but what we would like to see in the in the sports car program now, uh, with the idea at the end to have maybe maybe for the best best driver a chance to rejoin them. All. Your two major championships, the LMS and the WC, each year they have pretty stable calendars. We don't see much change. Obviously, we're back here at Barcelona for the first time in a decade with an ACO championship. We haven't had the race yet, but the, the organisation and the build-up to this event, how's it been on the organisational side? Well, you know, Barcelona is a very experimented uh, circuit with a very good staff, very good people. So it was good to... It was good to set up the event here. On the sporting side, they are very efficient on the track. We have professional team, I mean, uh, in all the garages and in the paddock, so easy for them to arrive like a circus and to set up the event in any other place, like Barcelona. Uh, the only thing we have made, which is new, is uh, we took in consideration the specific form of the summer period with a very high temperature during the day, possibility to race in the evening. So we have made the idea to do a two days meeting, Friday, Saturday, finishing late evening, on Saturday can you imagine that the European Le Mans series this weekend they will race under the, the daily condition then the sunset condition then the night condition after four hours the podium then immediately after the podium we organize a pit lane party with food trucks tapas and sangria Ramblas will be here in the pit lane of, of Barcelona Catalonia circuit that's clearly the idea and that we will share with all the teams all the mechanics all the people that's purely the the, 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 the the mentality and the atmosphere that the mood you can find in the European Le Mans series. That's really good things. Fantastic. And then we got the the WC prologue next week. Yeah. How do you think that's gonna go? I mean it's been a it's been a bit of a an odd few weeks for the WC on the entry list front, but we've still got a a lot of sports cars coming to this. Yeah, we uh, that's um, I would say a mandatory training because the officials need to control the electronics and many parameters with the car. It's, it's also the, the, the possibility to all the cars to run together and to see where they stay. You, do, we, you will never have a clear idea about the performance, but you have, they, they will stay together for two days. A lot of run. A big opportunity to test uh, some different drivers and uh, many, many teams will make the final choice for the driver's lineup during the prologue, which is really interesting. And the real start of the, of the WC will be definitely in Silverstone first weekend of, of September with the round one. Uh, and we know that this is uh, what we call a transition season, let's say, because we will have the new regulation entering in September 20. I speak for the top categories. And for all the other, will be another very promising season with the biggest LMP2 grid this year, definitely. Top team, very good team. The fact that we welcome, for example, a, a team like United is a big value in the paddock. They are very professional, so they will bring something for sure. Um, now the Netherlands team is also under the control with TDS, with a big experience. So it will be very interesting in P2. And so many other, Alpine will be here to defend his title, uh, uh, Jackie Chan also. So you will have a strong grid uh, in LMP2. GT3 top uh, endurance manufacturers, the most experimented with a huge story. And at the end, GTM a strong rig with a big battle. So it will be something very interesting. The show will be here also for the, for the season eight, no question. I have to ask about LMP1, Gerard. Are you disappointed in what we've seen? Uh, how, just, well, yeah, how disappointed yeah, no, are you? Who is not disappointed by that? Everybody is disappointed because that's... You mean, I mean, you speak about the, the, the SMP decision, so... I was surprised, like many people, because we, we didn't have any sign like this just before. But my philosophy is that we have to respect always the decision from the competitors. The, 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 this, is, this is their decision and uh, we have to respect that. To be very frankly with you, I was very sad for ART because it's a very pro team that we like to have inside the paddock and, uh, and I really hope to see them back very soon. 
Um, and uh, at the end, uh, you know, that's always the same story. The paddock, you have new entry, you have some people leaving, some people arriving. And this is a big cycle like this. We still have 31 cars on the grid, which is very strong. One of the biggest we never had before. So uh, I would say that uh, that's the part of the story. We have to accept this decision. Very frankly, we are focusing now on the preparation of the season to get happy the 31 car on the grid. We are looking seriously also uh, with uh, the coming season in 2021. All the staff is working on the hypercar regulation also, which is the next big step for the story of the sports car. So uh, the, the, I think that we have to see uh, the positive things and not to stop necessarily with a decision like this that we have to respect and we regret definitely. But this is their the own decision. No I comments. Think, I think there is plenty of excitement, obviously, for Hypercar. But I think a lot of fans want to know what we can expect from the racing in LMP1 this season. Because we have got a whole season to get through before we get there. Will we finally see the EOT, the BOP, work so that Toyota Challenge for wins? I know that this is not the tendance now, but the communication is going quickly and quickly, and sometimes the communication is a little bit in advance with the action. And I'm pretty sure that I can tell you one thing. Before the start of the season, you will have a lot of new information regarding the current season in LMP1. Regarding the regulation, regarding the content, regarding many things. So we have to stay very quiet. We are working a lot on the backstage, but backstage is the backstage, so as not in front of the media. There is many people working a lot to try to provide something very interesting. And uh, um, I would like just to give you an appointment in Silverstone and to see what has been the decision regarding the technical side, regarding the EOT, regarding the different decisions they can take to make sure that there is really real interest on the track. Let's see, many things will happen. That's just the beginning of the summer and the season starts only in September. Prologue is just a test. So... That's not really a place to communicate. It's the place just to demonstrate, to be, to test the car, to test the driver, to have some feeling. They play. They play a game. The game starts in September. Let's see what's going on in September. Perfect. Then we'll catch up with Silverstein. I'm sure. With sure. pleasure. Gerard, it's been a pleasure. Thank you me, very much. Same for me. Thank you very much. I've got with me now Harry Tinknell. He's, he's here at Barcelona with the, with the Thunderhead by Carlin effort in, uh, in LMP2 with their Dallara. Um, Harry, before we go any further and talk about WC stuff, bit of IMSA, I thought it'd be nice to get a little bit of a uh, little bit of insight into the Carlin effort here. Um, there's a lot of the readers um, of Marshall's pieces and a lot of listeners to the Marshall Pruitt podcast will be aware of Carlin for their indie car exploits, um, but this is them doing sports car racing, and it's a very different challenge for them. Tell us a little bit about how it's been so far for these guys. Yeah, obviously, I, you know, I used to race with Carlin um, as you know many of the, the you know the top British, European, even American um, drivers have come through you know the junior ranks, uh, you know F3 or GP3, GP2 with Carlin, World Series by Renault. So you know they're obviously one of the, you know the most successful junior motorsport team uh, in the UK. Um, and uh, I've known Jack uh, Manchester for for quite a while now. We're, we're good friends. We live quite close to each other. Uh, in London and um, um, Jack wanted to step up from GT3 into LMP2 and um, obviously with uh, him living in Cobham and, and Carlin just down the road in Farnham um, made perfect sense to sort of uh, you know with, with I think Trevor's been looking for a while now to, to step up into, into into sports cars or, or, or certainly make that transition and obviously you know at Carlin there's a, a lot of you know good single seater talent coming through and as we know you know drivers are moving to sports cars earlier and earlier I think you know looking back you know people like Ollie Turvey Brendan Hartley even sort of myself probably started that move of going to sports cars a bit earlier and so it makes perfect sense for Carlin to have that option available to them so um, yeah the Thunderhead Carlin uh, effort's been really good fun so far um, you know obviously Carlin have that fantastic uh, relationship with Delara. I think they've had over 80 chassis from them over the years it's incredible wow. so uh um, made made sense to continue that, and uh, and obviously for Jack's first foray into into LMP2, uh, it's a perfect perfect situation for him to to learn his craft in the in the European Le Mans series. You know, obviously I've got great memories of being in this championship over the years. It's a fantastic uh, series, lots of good tracks, and obviously hopefully it's going to lead into you know a Le Mans 24 hour effort for the team next year. But uh, we've got to get the results on track first, and we'll keep pushing and trying to improve the car and see how we can how we go. 
How are you finding life in the in the Dallara? Because for various reasons, as we know globally in LMP2 as it, as it stands, there's a lot of Oracles out there, few Ligiers, only a handful, very small handful of Dallaras are out there racing. Is it a car that has potential with, with this Carlin effort to be able to score some big results? We know it can win races, as some people have done it in the past, um, but up against this huge ELMS field, what, what, what's the expectation for the rest of the season now that now the team's actually up to speed? Yeah, definitely. I think, obviously, you know, Orica is is the car to beat at the moment. Um, we're the only Delara in the championship, which is probably a good thing in some ways in terms of we can just focus on getting, you know, all that Delara um, support and, and, and trying to improve um, improve the, the car going forward. Certainly, the, it, the car has potential, but at the moment we are lacking in a few areas. And so let's see what happens. Hopefully we can we can try and maybe get some... Some upgrades from the a- the ACR. I think Delara know what they need to do to to fix the car, um, and obviously, you know, be ideal if we have a championship where you've got like three or four different cars all on the similar level. As at the moment, certainly Orica seems to be a little bit ahead. But having said all that, you know, we've made big strides with, with the setup and uh, engineering from from the car inside and taking some of their single seater expertise. Uh, you know, we've got people like Ricky Taylor, who you know used to run the the GP2 and World Series by Renault cars, sort of heading up this this project team team manager. So we've got a lot of experience, and we found found quite a, a lot so far. And I think we're, we're stepping closer to the pace, and you know, tire deg, everything like that's a lot lot better. So uh, it's going in the right direction, but certainly we we need to keep pushing. And uh, you know, at the moment we're, we're fighting for top tens and. Um, if we can uh, sort of hopefully move from the sort of midfield up to the front end of the grid by the end of the year, that's the plan. Bit of WC chat now. We've got the the WC prologue directly after this four-hour race for the LMS here at Barcelona. Um, there's no Fords on the grid, and there's no car with with you and Andy in it, which is for a lot of us, especially those of us who follow the championship regularly, going to be really strange. I can't imagine what it's what it's like for you. Yeah, it's 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 a shame. Uh, it's it it is a shame. Obviously, Andy and I have a great relationship. You know, it's kind of uh, I take the Mickey out of him for being old and past it, but he's just as quick as he's ever been, and uh, and we you know we got on really well, and he taught me a massive amount about you know set up and just general life as a racing driver and you know being able to soak up that experience for the last three, three or four years um but it was always the plan before it was going to be a four-year program and uh and um obviously you know the way the championship changed you know we should you know how we how it was all originally planned we would be going until november in the sort of 2019 season but obviously with the super season it's it's kind of changed things but but yeah, it's, a, it's it's a shame you know we'd love to have continued and uh, i know there's you know there's a lot of work going into getting four gts out on some sort of grid at some point but um until we all know exactly what's going on then yeah it's a shame and uh obviously you know i'd like to be in the work you know i really enjoyed it the last four years but uh as it stands at the moment, going to have to be watching on TV, but hopefully I can uh, pick something up for Le Mans. Mm, yeah, well, talking about Le Mans, obviously that that's still kind of only a, well, a month away yeah. it was. Um, what was the emotion like at the end of that race, knowing that the program had had come to an end? Um, I mean, end of the race, I was I was in the car just fighting like hell. I was like, I don't want to finish fourth, you know, I want, I want another podium. So. Uh, it was a bit of a strange one. I was just so exhausted, to be honest. I kind of just, uh, just um, not the only to, one. Yeah, yeah. I just had to go back to the motor but just, just relax for the evening, to be honest. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was a bit of a, it was, a, it, it was a bit of a, a strange one. There was definitely a few tears from a few different people, and uh, but you know, a lot of beers were drunk as well on the Sunday night, and kind of, you know, it's been very successful. It's been a great period uh, obviously for Ford to be back in the championship I think it's the GTE sort of golden era in, in WEC uh, especially the last couple of years with sort of 10 cars on the grid and, um, and at Le Mans you know sort of 17, 18 like all the top lineups battling it out and I mean at the start of Le Mans this year you know it's like Aston and then me and then Corvette Ferrari BMW Porsche everyone right there you know it's incredible so all, all no to tell so it's going to be a shame um, but uh, but yeah uh, I'm free so call me <laughs> if, any, if anyone needs <laughs> no, how, how much are you, how much are you going to miss driving that car because it is still today if they released that as a brand new car today it would still look futuristic it doesn't yeah. hasn't aged one bit has it I know I know it's 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 incredible you know it's uh and that's that's the that's the that's the annoying thing because it's still competitive. You know, we, we were a tenth off pole position at Le Mans this year, and uh, you know we were right up there. You know, finished third at Sebring, and 
um, you know the cars on pole at Spa. You know it's 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 absolutely still got the pace to be right there, and uh, um, it's a shame that you know it might not be on the grid at all next year. But uh, honestly, like you know, you read the press. There's a, you know I think there's a lot of good people who are trying to um, work to, to put something together. But uh, I, I can. It's, I'm in a quite nice position where I'm just kind of reading that and I don't really have too much inside information so there's not, not too much I, I can uh, divulge on or, or get myself into trouble for but uh, um, hopefully you know, I'm reading this like everyone else and hoping that there'll be GTs on the grid somewhere at some point but uh, we'll have to wait and see um, until then yeah just uh, be thankful for all the all, all the you know it's it, all the good memories and uh it's it's moved my career on massively i think uh i wouldn't be where i am now without that ford gt opportunity and you know obviously thankful to ford and george howard chapel and um you know larry holt raj nair multimatic everyone like that um mark rushbrook and dave perisak at ford because you know i had a meeting at daytona in 2016 and then i walked in with all these execs there and there was a there's a little wooden chair in the middle with no back to it, and I was like, "I guess this is my this is my seat then for this interview." And everyone, you know, in their big leather sofas in the motorhome, and I was like, you know, felt like a little schoolboy being summoned to the headmaster. But uh, to be given the opportunity to, to to you know initially be the endurance driver without having any GT experience, when there's so many fantastic GT drivers out there, was uh, was a was a big risk for them, I guess, and a uh, big opportunity for me. And so I'm. I'm proud of myself for grabbing it with both hands and making the most of it and uh, thankful to, to Ford and Multimatic uh, and hopefully you know that relationship's going to continue for a long time. I can't do an interview with you, especially right now, without talking about IMSA and talking about that Mazda programme. I mean, on the sister podcast to um, Inside the Sports Car Paddock, the Weekend Sports Cars, we get asked questions about the Mazda IMSA programme all the time. People love it. They lap it up. And they've been waiting a while to see that f- big win finally happen. And it did happen. And then you decided that one win's not enough let's make it two in a row give us a little bit of a sense of just how incredible that Watkins Glen meeting was yeah Watkins was uh, just incredible I mean we there's been so many times where we've had good pace and we've gone into qualifying and we've had a pole position and we had the cars right there and then something's happened in the race or whatever and we've not managed to see it out and so you know, to have great pace, to to you know race hard at the front, uh, all all six hours was 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 amazing, and I think there was like there's been a big step change in reliability this year, and I never, you know, once thought oh you know what happens if the car doesn't make it to the end, you know, the Mazda Team Yos and AER Multimatic they've done an amazing job, and I think um, um, put to bed some of the demons of the past, and uh, I think we're legitimate front runners now in in IMSA and. Um, we got a little bit unlucky with that full that full course yellow that put Montoya ahead, and I was like, "There's no way, there's no way that anyone's taking this away from me." And so when the, and the bloody door started flapping open, yeah. <laughs> it's like, "Oh come well, on, just go off the, the line." <laughs> when the opportunity came, I was like, "Right, I'm sending it." And I, I knew, you know, you're not going to pass Montoya without a fully committed move. And I think, you know, this was 110 percent commitment, and uh, yeah, somebody's door panel got stuck in the side of the car and everything like that. But I wasn't too worried actually, and uh, that feeling of victory then afterwards, it was a mixture of just like pure emotion, relief, just excitement, like we'd finally done it, and like just believing it happened. And you know, for me, I've been in the program for a year and a half, and I've experienced you know some of the ups and downs. But some of the people in the program, you know, John Doonan and Tristan Nunes and um, JB, you know, they've been in the program five, six, seven years, and like it's been a long time coming, you know, so it was just great to see the excitement on their faces as well, and to deliver that first win for Mass, you know, everyone will remember that, that was fantastic, and we had so many people in the autograph session come up to us and go, come on, you know, we're rooting for you guys, I think we were like the plucky underdogs that mm. everyone was rooting for over the last couple of years, and I think now we're like, we're, we're, you know, we're up there with the Penske's everyone's and Everyone's like, you winning now? Well, <laughs> that was the thing. It, 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 obviously, we didn't have long to celebrate because it was most sport the next weekend, and everyone was coming. Up, oh, go, you know, get a second win, get the second win. And I, I kind of said to a few of the American reporters, you know, hopefully it's going to be like a London bus. You know, we we'll wait a long time for one win and two come at once. And they kind of looked at me with a slightly 
like confused expression. <laughs> they heard the, the <laughs> London bus analogy before, but uh, I love it. I love it. You got uh, it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, you know, I try to bring a bit of uh, you know British, a few British sayings to uh, to the American uh, American paddock. JB's got a uh, he's got note a note on his phone for all my English sayings and the translation into American, so that he knows. You know, Does he, he can, know when tea time it, is yet. <laughs> <laughs> He was, uh, there was a funny one at Sebring when I said to Andy, "Don't, don't you nick my lead?" And talking about my iPhone charger, and he was like, "Hold on, hold on, hold on a minute, guys. What the hell are you talking about?" <laughs> it's like, <laughs> "Don't steal my iPhone charger, please, Jimmy." <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, we've had a we've had, we have we have a good laugh out there, and uh, like I say, two wins on the bounce, incredible, F- fully deserved, fully, you know there was no lucky safety car or anything that was pure performance and so let's see how what happens the last three races uh i'm sure there'll be a few tweaks in the bop but i think you know we've we've proven the cars quick enough the plucky uh force and AR engine is is more than a match for for our bigger displacement rivals and um and yeah i think we'll we'll go into this off season um with a lot of development to come, a lot of um, reliability testing, and, and go into next year um, fighting for a championship legitimately. And uh, I think we can. But it's, but it's easy to wheel out all the cliches after a win like that, saying, you know, the monkey's off your back, and all this sort of stuff. But does it actually make a tangible difference when you turn up at a place like most, but with a win under your belt in the way that everyone performs? Because surely at that point, just the relief and the, and the pressure kind of being reduced a little bit must have made a difference to the guys behind the scenes honestly it does does you see you feel it in the whole team you know just everyone's just walking around that inch taller and just like this everyone's just much more relaxed i think there was huge pressure this year to get that first win we need we need a win we need a win we need a win i think you saw it sometimes so you know we had i had a bit of a a shunt in detroit you know i was fighting for third and kind of got like biffed off and by another car but it was kind of you know you're taking like 95% risks to try and get the car up to the front because you know you need that first swim. Whereas if you're fighting for a championship, you might, you know, think twice about about doing a high risk overtake on a on a street track. Um, but the the pressure for that first swim was so intense, and I think we went to Mo Sport and just everyone was just, you know, a little bit more relaxed, more smiles on the faces, and you know, Mazda, you know, Mazda wanted to win really badly for a long time team yost are used to winning um and so it just once you get that first win just everyone is just you know it just all comes a little bit easier and i said in the interview in victory lane in, in road america um sorry road america in watkins again like i i truly believe that once we had the first one two three four and five would follow quite soon and sure enough number two followed the week week later so let, let, let's see what happens in the last three races but uh but we're certainly we're certainly walking around, uh, you know, feeling feeling good about ourselves and feeling good that all this effort that we have put in, all those engine blow ups and bad tests and disappointments in racing, all worth it. And because I can tell you, standing on that podium in uh, in Watkins, that it it would all it, every single moment was all worth it. Harry Tignall, absolute pleasure. Best of luck this weekend, and we'll speak to you very soon. Thanks, dude. Appreciate it. With me now is Nicola Lapierre. He's got a big week ahead of him with Cool Racing in the European Le Mans Series and the WC Prologue. But before I go anywhere, Nicola, I want to talk to you about Le Mans. What a fantastic result that was. Your 100% winning record stands. Alpine got to celebrate on the top step of the podium this year for the mm-hmm. first time. Give us a, a belated reaction to that and a bit of a reflection because that is a mighty achievement. Yeah, I mean, if you if you think about it, it's quite unrealistic. I mean, I know how hard it is to to win this race and uh, and to win it four times in a row in the LMP2 is is pretty amazing. But uh, this could have not been made without the very strong uh, teams behind me and good teammates as well. This is what I always say: if you want to succeed in Le Mans, you need to be in a very strong team and and together with strong teammates. So first of all, I, I need to thank them for for this, and then. Obviously, it was uh, special for me because it was my last race with the team, so it was a bit of an extra pressure because we have been together since more than three years now and with Alpine, and I wanted to live in a good way, so I had a bit of, of, of pressure to finish this well, and uh, it, was, it was great to finish it this way, you know, to win the 24 Le Mans plus the World Championship that was going together was, uh, was pretty special for me. 
yeah so you, you've moved on from from Alpine and and you've hooked up with Cool Racing which is a team that many many listeners may not know but they've come out of LMP3 racing and they've jumped up to P2 in LMS and they're doing WC as well this is a team that's going places isn't it yeah, it's going great. I mean, uh, it's big steps for us. And when I joined the team um, last year, they was just uh, doing LMP3, and uh, they wanted to step up in the LMP2 and uh, to get somebody to to help them with a lot of experience. And for me, it was a really beautiful challenge with very nice people, very motivated. And I love this uh, this kind of challenges and to. To start not from zero because they used to race in P3, but uh, almost from zero because P2 is a way different category. And uh, so we started with the testing session and then starting with the ELMS. And now we have we are planning to go to WEC. So it's a lot going on. And obviously our target is Le Mans next year. This will be our, our main mission. And uh, I'm very happy. I, I have a lot of fun here. It's a lot of work as well because we have to to prepare and set up everything in the team to find the right people to fit at the good places also to help the two other drivers which are a silver driver and a bronze driver with only LMP3 experience so there's a lot of time analysis uh, data and videos and trying to help them to progress as fast as possible so it's very very busy but uh, to be honest I'm, I love it yeah. Tell me a little bit more about the decision to change teams because it can't have been easy to leave what you had with Alpine with the amount of success you've had with them. Yeah, it's always uh, difficult to leave when you are in a success mood, you know, but uh, I felt that it was the right time. I stayed there more than, than three years. We achieved a lot there and uh, I felt that the team, the maturity of the team was really strong and my role was only driving, you know, and, and, and now I, I, I enjoy driving as much as uh, the same than doing the stuff out from the track so for me it's as important to be involved in the team outside from the track than on the track so in Alpine I felt like it was a bit of the end of my my job out of the track there because the team could could run really easy and smoothly without me so I felt like I would prefer to go somewhere uh, people need me more you know out of the track and and this was exactly the case of this team with a really fantastic uh, program as well. Doing ELMS and WEC in the same team is, is great. So, so yeah, I took the decision uh, early this year. And, uh, yeah, I'm very happy and, and comfortable with this decision. Give me a bit of an evaluation of how you think they've done so far. Because, as you say, it's, it's not easy to jump into P2, especially doing a World Championship and the European Championship. And they're still running P3 cars as well. They have got a big, big effort here. Are they managing OK? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the team is growing like like crazy, so we have to be really careful and and to make sure we have the right people at the right places. But, uh, no, they, they, they've been doing great. I mean, we... Uh, in terms of performance, we catch pole position in Monza, which was quite uh, impressive for a second race of the team. And uh, the average are good as well. We On the free practice, we are always there. So the pace is really there. In the race, we need to improve uh, pit stuff and refueling and a few stuff. We are working on it really hard. But obviously, we need a bit of time to, to, to be at the level of, of strong LMP2 team. You know, the... LMP2 changed a lot this last uh, five, six years. It went really professional with really strong teams around here. So we need, we need a bit of time, but I'm very happy with the, with the progress they made so far and with the, with the timing of it. The next step for us is the WEC. We start with the prologue next week, so this will be another adventure. But I feel like the team is doing the, the right job and we are going on the right direction. In, in, in the short time we had, they, 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 did, they did really great. We know um, that the WC has a, a highly competitive um, LMP2 class, but the, the ELMS maybe doesn't quite get as much publicity as the WC for obvious reasons, and people may may not may not watch it as much. We get like 18, 19 cars in the LMP2 class here. It's the biggest P2 field in the world. Give the listeners a bit of a sense of just how competitive it is now this year with, with the grid we have. It's super strong. I mean, in terms of... Um of speed, I think you can compare uh, the team from ELMS and from WEC, the top team, they are running the same kind of speed. If you look G-Drive in Le Mans, they were same kind of speed than other cars, or EDEC, they were also there. But what is very impressive here is the quantity of strong cars. You know, you have, at the beginning of weekend, at least 
we have seven or eight cars that can win the race and 15 that can finish on the podium. So I like it a lot to race here, you know, and the battle, they are really strong and you also fight for the overall win in the ELMS, which is not the case in the wake. So I have a lot of pleasure to, to drive here in the ELMS and the series is, is growing a lot and uh, it's, it's good fun and the calendar is good with nice track uh, around Europe. Uh, the level is strong, so no, I, I, lo I love it, to be honest, I really love it. Wake is different because you go around the world and the races are a bit longer, so it's a bit different, but here it's, it's, it's a lot of fun and I would say it's even tougher uh, for a driver to succeed here than in, in the Wake. Mm. Yeah, we, we hear a lot about, at the moment, the, the state of the P1 class and what we have in GT Pro, and there may not be the sheer number of P2 cars that we have in the LMS in the WC entered for the for the upcoming season, but there's still some really strong teams out there. So where, where do you think Cool Racing's expectations lie with, with the grid we have in P2 in WC? No, it will be, I think we, we have to, we have a gentleman racing for us as well in the team, so uh, the most important for us is to be in front of the team that are running the same kind of lineup. So I would say, a top four uh, would be good uh, for us in the WEC. This is what we need to achieve uh, as fast as possible. And our gentleman at the very Alex Kwani has a very low experience in sports cars, so he's improving a lot. You know, so it's hard to really set target for now as he's still improving race after race. But um, I believe we can, yeah, we can target top four, and the work would be good. And here in the LMS, the top five would be a great achievement for us and um, and then maybe next season we, we will target for something higher depending on how the, 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 the drivers are evolving. Perfect, thank you very much for your time Nick, I'll speak to you soon. I've got with me now Ben Crawley, the uh, Director of Goodyear Racing Europe. We're here at Barcelona at the Circuit de Catalunya and it's going to be a huge week. Um, for the LMP2 tyre battle um, because we've got a big change a big shift uh, in LMP2 for the upcoming season and that is the fact that Dunlop won't be a part of it but Goodyear will and uh, Goodyear are coming back coming back to the international sports car scene so I thought we'd get a little bit of an insight into how this is all working Ben, thank you for joining us um, give us a uh, first of all a, a general timeline of how this all came together with Goodyear coming back to sports car racing well uh, I think when we start the story really we're, we're at pains to state that Goodyear's never really been away from motorsport you know we see that motorsport is part of Goodyear's DNA um, it's still been heavily active in uh, in NASCAR racing in the States um, uh, for a whole whole period of time uh, and really what we're intending to do terms of bringing the brand back in Europe and into international racing is is um, really as part of an overall brand building um, focus uh, uh, and engagement for the brand um, based on the fact that the timing now is, is perfect because we're, we're re-establishing our credentials and our, our presence within uh, let's say the high performance um, car tyre market um, with the, the launch of a, of a road legal um, car range in terms of Eagle F1 Supersport uh, tyres which the company has launched in, in the last few months in Europe so to then come back on track from a racing point of view is perfect timing for us Yeah and just for, for the listeners sake explain the relationship that uh, Goodyear has with Dunlop because as my understanding is that Goodyear is a parent company of, of Dunlop Europe um, so it means that a lot of the people involved in the current LMP2 programme on Dunlop side will be part of this won't they? So Goodyear is the parent company of Dunlop um, uh, in Europe. Um, it's quite a complex uh, overall ownership of the Dunlop brand globally. Um, Goodyear owned the rights to the Goodyear brand clearly uh, globally. And that was one of the things in terms of uh, for us to be able to fully activate um, a racing presence globally with the Goodyear brand gives us more opportunities than we currently have with the Dunlop brand today. Um, in terms of people working in the paddock uh, and, uh, and representing us at events, um, there'll be some new faces, but there'll, there'll be a lot of the same team that um, the teams are used to in terms of the faces. Um, but overall, uh, leading with the Goodyear brand gives us more opportunities in terms of really um, making the impactful scale globally in terms of the, the, the WEX championship. 
Before we go further than talking about LMP2, because LMP2 is where you're, you guys are starting in, in the World Endurance Championship, tell me about the tyre range um, that's going to be part of the World Endurance Championship. Are these just Dunlop tyres rebranded? Are they brand new? How, how's that working? Yeah, um, obvious question to ask when, when, uh, when we're discussing this topic. Um, they are all brand new Goodyear tyres. Um, uh, what we're going to be doing across the, the prologue and then in a, in a private three-day test, more or less um, a few days after at the same uh, Catalonia circuit, is um, we're, we're really evaluating our final options um, to come to what, what will then be a, a defined and declared range uh, for the Silverstone race. Um, so across the teams that are testing with, with Goodyear tyres uh, in the next few days, and as I say, in, in a private test, we'll be narrowing down the different options that we're carrying currently into what will be our declared range. Give us a sense of the magnitude of this um, upcoming week in terms of getting customers on board because on the entry list for the World Endurance Championships upcoming season we've got some teams that are blank in the tyre column, haven't made their decision yet. How many teams are going to be sampling your tyres this week and, and when will these choices be made? Yeah, so uh, there'll be four teams that are testing uh, the Goodyear tyres uh, out of the eight LMP2 teams that will be participating in the prologue. Um, those four teams are uh, the High Class Racing Team, uh, the Joda Sport, the Jackie Chan and uh, the Racing Team Netherlands in terms of the four cars. Um, uh, a, a number of the other teams will be running uh, the different options that I've just described in terms of um, doing final preparations and car setup and, and really helping us um, narrow down what is a, a range of tyres to, to what will be the immediate introduction of the range um, at Silverstone. There are regulations surrounding P2 teams and how much they can do in terms of changing between tyre brands. Some teams have already declared Mitchell on the entry list. Is that now locked in? How does it explain how that works in terms of whether you can get those teams potentially on board if they're impressed with what they see? So teams are allowed to make one tyre change per season. So um, if teams have, have already made a, a commitment in terms of a signed contract, um, if they were then to change, they wouldn't be able to change for the remainder of the season. Um, but overall, um, uh, from that point of view, it, re- it would really depend on um, how firm a commitment teams have made at this stage. Um, uh, and to be honest, in terms of the uh, the, the declared list and, and tyre options and things, um, uh, often teams are just putting blanks because it's the it's the, the stage of the season where they're not they're not. Um, uh, they don't have to definitively select a tyre brand at that stage. In terms of general marketing uh, uh, and customer t- produ- producing customer tyres, how valuable is something like the World Endurance Championship? Do you feel to Goodwood as opposed to you know just find, is it just about getting tyres to the Le Mans Twenty Four Hours, or do you see value in taking these tyres around the world as part of the calendar? Yeah, I mean, like I was saying, we see the opportunity to activate the, the racing presence more with the Goodyear brand, having the global uh, ownership and rights. Um, I think in, in endurance uh, overall as a category, um, what appeals to, to us about that is really for the Goodyear brand that you know it's, it's uh, the perfect kind of challenge of performance, but um, uh, consistency and durability. Um, so it really is that challenge of making making very high performing tyres that last and, and we see uh, you know, really strong parallels um, with everyday road tyre needs from consumers in terms of good quality, high performing tyres but tyres that will last in terms of giving good longevity and consistency for drivers every day LMP2 from what I gather is, is in terms of your plans just to start give me a sense of the opportunity that you guys have in the rest of what we have in the World Endurance Championship and in the European Le Mans Series for that matter going forward yeah I mean o- overall um, uh, obviously there's, there's uh, some change coming within uh, the World Endurance Championship with the new hypercar regulations um, and we very much see uh, the, the, this entry of Goodyear as a first step in our overall racing comeback programme and um, we're coming back in LMP2. Um, categories such as hypercar and GTE are of interest to us, um, uh, but we'll continue to to evaluate WEC along with other um, national, European, and, and international racing series um, uh, continually, really, to, to make sure that we we're finding the best opportunities from a technical and from a marketing value point of view to to be uh, using as platforms for the Goodyear brand. 
There will be an overlap in terms of the end of the end of the European Le Mans series um, and the start of the World Endurance Championship season. So we will see P2 teams still running on Dunlop and Goodyear simultaneously. But when it comes to next year, and we've got things like Le Mans, has a decision been made on where Dunlop will be by then? Um, will, or will we see potentially Goodyear, Dunlop and Michelin represented at 24 hours next year in June? I think in the short term, for example, fast forward a few weeks to Silverstone, um, you will see uh, when it's the sort of double header weekend, you'll have um, a Dunlop setup and Dunlop tyres within the European Le Mans series uh, race, and then uh, you know uh, adjacent to that in the in the separate paddock, uh, a Goodyear uh, operation setup and Goodyear specific uh, tyres racing in in the WEC race. Um, looking at further ahead to that. Um, Really, there's there's lots of variables that could influence what what tyres are present at Le Mans 24 hours 2020. Whether that's because there's different series that feed into the overall grid, um, and ultimately uh, teams within the European Le Mans series for the for the 2020 season um, will still be making their decisions about which tyre brand to race within that um, later this year. So we couldn't categorically today say which brands teams will or will, will not be racing with at, at Le Mans um, and we'll be making decisions from a company point of view um, when the time is right with, with each individual series like that. Before I go into hypercar I want to talk a little bit more about GTE and expand on the point you just made about there being an interest from Goodyear and looking at GTE um, but it is a challenge because we know that manufacturers do have affiliations with specific tyre brands um, and that's usually linked with their road car product range isn't it? How realistic is it that we could see um, a Goodyear tyres, um, a team running Goodyear tyres going forward? Um, well, in the short term, it's it's clearly not from the beginning of this season um, because we're focusing our efforts in LMP2. Uh, I think what what we're focused on uh, in the short to mid term is is establishing a stronger presence for the Goodyear brand within uh, within WEC. Um, and uh, you know clearly some of the other categories that we're talking about, either hypercar or GTE, are platforms to do that. Um, what's important for us is that we're able to demonstrate links with OEMs uh, and be able to uh, to link our racing uh, investments and activities with our road business. Um, but as I say, you know we we aren't just um, focused on WEC, and we'll continue to evaluate this series versus other platforms and, and series elsewhere to see what what delivers the best combination of benefits for the brand. Now, hypercar prototype is obviously it's huge news in sports car racing going forward, and for that, um, as far as I'm aware, they're continuing with um, it being a, a single make tire formula. What are the resources from Goodyear's side like? Could they effectively put out to tender for year one when you think we've got, obviously, the, the new set of hypercars and we've got grandfathered P1s? How much of a change does that be and how much of a change will that be? And um, when is this tender process going to happen? Um, so some of those questions are uh, very pertinent and uh, <laughs> relevant questions. Uh, we're continuing to have dialogue with, um, with the ACO and FIA on those aspects. Um, you know, in, internally we're um, uh, we're fairly well advanced in terms of evaluating uh, the opportunity of hypercar, um, but clearly there, there are uh, it, there is a very tight timeline from a technical point of view, um, and we need to get firm clarity around tender timings, process, uh, and how that will ha- that that whole process will work to be able to allow us to make um, uh, the right and reasoned decision. Um, in, a, in an appropriate time frame so um, we're very much looking forward to getting some, some further clarity and answers uh, over the coming days and weeks you see how much of a challenge that's going to be at the moment now the regulations are out there because not only are we going to have potentially in year one grandfathered P1 cars in that class but we're also going to have cars that are road cars we're going to have cars that are specifically prototypes we're going to have some hybrid some non-hybrid as a tyre manufacturer that's got to be a real challenge to make a single tyre for an entire category that's so diverse but you must relish that challenge if you if you were successful yeah we relish it um i mean it it, it could be that it's a single tyre supplier rather than a single tyre spec um, so it could be that there's different specs or, or different combinations across different different vehicle platforms or models as you describe so um, that's one of, when we say we need some, some further clarity and, and alignment on uh, the technical side of things those are the sort of things that we're, um, we're actively thinking and talking about currently um, but 
clearly, yeah, the, the, the technical challenge is one that we would relish if, if we were the chosen tire partner to, to move forward. Final question is is IMSA, because so you mentioned earlier the fact that Goodyear's just got a big base in, in North America with supplying NASCAR tyres, for instance, in motorsport. Um, but IMSA's still got the potential with GTLM being an open tyre formula. Is that something you're also looking at? Um, in the short term, uh, it, it's not something that we're focusing on, but we... Uh, we, we never say never, and we're, we're always open to evaluating opportunities. Um, clearly, the, the, the focus of our, our racing program in, in the US is, is on NASCAR. Um, but uh, overall, um, the team there also see value and, and, uh, and benefits of being in sports car racing. So um, it, it's, it's nothing that we would ever discount. Thank you very much for your time, Ben. It's been an absolute pleasure.